Hey friend, it's me Vasco with a quick announcement. We at the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast are organizing this year's Scrum Master Summit. For tickets and details on the summit, check out the URL bit.ly forward slash SM Summit 22. All one word S-M-S-U-M-M-I-T 22. And now on to the show. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Team Tuesday this week with Julie Wyman. Hi, Julie. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me again. Absolutely. So on Team Tuesday, we talk about teams, of course, but we also, as usual, want to know what was the book that most influenced you in your career as a Scrum Master, Julie? Yeah, this one was hard. There's uh, too many on my bookshelf, but uh, since I had to pick one, Impact Mapping by uh, Goiko Adzik. For me, I picked this one because it really helped crystallize the concept of business impact and delivering actual value versus just output. So delivering features, but not knowing what they tie to. So how common it is that we predefine a solution before we even really examine whether it's likely to have that intended impact and if it's really going to help us achieve what we're looking for. To me, it's, you know, it's like, it's short and it has lots of visuals. So it's like you see, like there's a technique and it's clear. Um, so that that's the one that I picked. One of the things that I really like about Goiko's books, there's there's many. He has different yeah. books uh, with the same I style. Have, I have like, multiple, but that's the one I picked. It's like very short to the point and then with a picture to help you grasp it. So really great for those of you out there who are visual thinkers. Remember it. Yeah. It's like you see the visual. It's like a little cue to remind you. And then the other thing, which you already said, and it was also a great transformation in my way of thinking as well, is this idea that we should organize the delivery process around business objectives, not around a backlog of, you know, an infinite, potentially very long backlog of things to do. And that that shift from the list of things to do to the impact we want to create it really transformed how I coach teams as well. It, it helped me to come up with different ways to help the teams even do simple things like define a goal, right? Like many teams don't even have sprint goals or, or even goals for a particular delivery. And impact mapping and, and uh, the lessons and tools that Goiko shares in the book and, and his multiple presentations also help with that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it really helps to move prioritization up a level. Like when you're trying to prioritize amongst hundreds, thousands of features, it's just like an endless challenge. When you're trying to prioritize amongst several like impacts or business goals, it just is like a little bit more focused, right? And it's 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 more impactful. Um, so it kind of shifted to like, okay, let's prioritize here first and then let's translate that into our next step action. So yeah, for me, it's it's had a lot of influence into how I try to coach. It doesn't always mean it's easy. <laughs> like I'm constantly trying to get people to put it into action. It's not like Reddit and we're like 100% doing it, but it's uh, always have the ideas floating around in my head now. And uh, w- one last thing that I just remembered is that uh, the impact mapping technique really beautifully enables a, a different way of thinking about software and product delivery, which is this options thinking there's also a book uh, called real options where where we talk about or actually the authors talk about options and and how to use those in your favor when developing software products and i think that the fact that the impact map is actually a set of options to achieve a particular goal that we can try and see which of the options actually has the biggest impact it, it really helps us to get out of this unless you do everything in the backlog you are doomed kind of perspective yeah Absolutely. And also just the the unvalidated assumption that everything we think will happen will happen, which is clearly not the case. So yeah, I think that's true. So of course, today's Tuesday. So we also talk about teams and we want to hear from you a story of a team and uh, how that team started to develop this little pattern or behaviors that ultimately led to problems. So tell us that story from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about the context. How big was the team? And then walk us through the multiple events that over time led to problems. So it is something that happened to one team, but it actually is something that I observed across a program. So I was supporting a large program. It was about 10 scrum teams at the time. They were all working together for a modernization effort to replace a heavily used existing system. 
And this particular instance, the instigator was triggered by an extremely pressured, stressful point in the program. So the self-destructing pattern that I observed was that at that moment in time, the team started to forgo their retrospectives. Now, these aren't teams that hadn't been doing them before. They had been doing them for many months. So it wasn't, you know, uh, it was a well-established habit beforehand, but they were initially under some pressure by leadership to, you know, quote unquote, streamline and free up as much time as possible for this surge. Don't you just love those words? Yes, exactly. Focus, streamline. So, you know, they were surging. And so for maybe one sprint's worth, there definitely was some pressure, you know, coming down from above. But then what I, you know, realized, I hadn't anticipated, and it actually took a little bit to realize it was happening, was that this pattern seemed to be extending long, longer after the surge itself. So they'd actually stopped surging. And despite that, the retros hadn't really come back fully across all the teams. So despite the fact that the teams could probably most have benefited from retrospection during the surge and after, they weren't really happening. And Scrum Masters, some seem to either be waiting for like explicit permission to bring them back instead of being the ones for their team advocating for it, or they were simply not prioritizing it amongst all the chaos that they they individually were experiencing, the team was experiencing, you know, maybe just undervaluing the influence that they could have. But either way, you know, they just ended up going without them for a much longer period of time until we had, you know, more, more explicit conversations as a program about it. So, you know, I was surprised by that. And I thought, okay, well, you know, these things, these things can happen. It was a very stressful time. You know, again, we all, we all have empathy. We all understand we're, we're, you know, we're people, there's stress. Also, you know, this happened in the last two years and there was constant uh, and endless amount of, of other stress. So we say, okay, sometimes these things happen. Maybe we're back on track. But even after that, I kept noticing that, you know, long after retros had for the most part resumed, there was this habit that would still pop up where it just seemed that more frequently than I would have expected, retros would sort of be rescheduled or postponed or canceled on occasion. And a frequent reason was, you know, to make time to finish an upcoming release without ever realizing that the fact that they always needed to do so was a prime candidate for a retro, not something worth postponing the retro for. The lack of self-reflection is scary. Yeah. And so, you know, again, everyone, there was a lot of pressure, right? But it, to me, I, I remember it's interesting. It's come up several times throughout my career in interviews. Uh, the question, like, what's your favorite agile ceremony? Kind of random question, but I always say retro because to me, it's the like thing that powers every other ceremony, right? It's just, it makes everything else better. And so I just, you know, have always been a believer that they're so important that, you know, if things are going so great, great, you can end early. Like I'm not saying, you know, I'm not a stickler saying you have to use every single moment, but you should never, you know, there should be really good reasons if you are going to change it. That's, that's just as important probably as anything else that we're doing really for these reasons, because if we're feeling pressure to postpone it, and it's really not that long of a time, it's probably a signal to us that there's something Shouldn't it be like that? Yeah. That's so obvious for you and me. I mean, I don't know for everybody, but definitely for you and me, at least, it's quite obvious. Like if you're rescheduling or canceling retros, you need to stop and have a retro about that. Like what's yeah. causing that? Why is it there? And what can, can we do to avoid that? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that 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 was my sense. But I think, you know, this program was one that was just constantly experiencing a lot of change. Like there was a lot of, change in priorities. There were a lot of changes in actually like the team membership a lot more than anyone would have liked. And so oftentimes people, you know, during those periods just felt like, oh, so much is changing. Like, you know, who's going to have, you know, this team is new. What are they going to have feedback on? You know, what, what are we going to be able to discuss? And, you know, and so they would just want to wait. It's like they kept wanting to wait until things had just stabilized a little bit or the team had better footing. And I was like, well, on this program, I don't know if we'll ever get there. And in a way, like this was our, our ability to kind of capture how the team feels in these moments or the impact of this, you know, 
the time. Right. And so it was, it was always very interesting to me because when they had them, like these scrum masters were extremely skilled, right? Like they were good facilitators, you know, they would generally have, you know, good, good discussions and, and get, I think, meaningful feedback from the team. But there was this, you know, it definitely didn't surprise me that there was like a downward pressure to like maximize hands-on keyboard time, lesson meeting time, right? From the leaders. As if brains worked through the fingers, right? Like, right. So, so you, you got exactly. two programmers. One is frantically typing at the keyboard. The other is playing with a tennis ball, looking at the ceiling. Which one is working the hardest? How can you know? Like the, the work happens inside the brain. So besides the checklist and a big post-it on the wall uh, next to our desk saying never reschedule or cancel the retro, what else, like one or two tips that you could share with our audience to make sure that those retros stick? For us, it was it was really about kind of connecting one-on-one with Scrum Masters and just having coaching sessions to better understand. Because as opposed to just saying like, you're doing it wrong. You need to not, right? Like did want to understand where were they coming from, right? Come from a place of discussion and understanding, you know, what are the factors? What are, what's driving you to consider this and and actually kind of discuss so that, you know, we had a back and forth and we could share more understanding. So part of that was coaching. And then part of it was to really try to explain the value of the consistency that like every time we move it, does it seem like that big of a deal that we shifted it three days later or a week later? On the surface, no, but what message does that send? And that's what we were trying to really emphasize is like our actions make it maybe seem like the retro is the least important of the meetings that we're holding. And we, what we were really trying to message is that you are the scrum masters and you're the stewards of agile here, right? You're the one modeling it. So if you're the ones that are saying, oh, this is okay and not fighting for it, others are surely not going to, right? Because they're also going to think that it's less important. So we were really trying to encourage that, you know, they may not win every single time, but that scrum masters should be the advocates and that there's really value in trying to protect that time, even if it meant that, you know, a couple people were missing. And that was the other thing is sometimes people were, to their credit, sometimes people were moving things around because they were playing the musical chairs game of trying to line up everyone's schedule. And in this this place, people were covering more teams than they should, and they were over over 100% allocated. And so they were constantly moving things around. But we said, you know, there's a value in keeping it closer to the end of the sprint, keeping it at the same time, and, you know, if we have to, you know, miss a few people, then that's actually something we can talk about as well, but just kind of keeping it to that time. Absolutely. Model the behavior. And one thing that we should ask ourselves as Scrum Masters in our Reflection Friday, maybe add that to the list, which is how do, do, how do my actions show what's really important? Yeah, that's a good one. That's a, a great story. Thank you for sharing that, Julie. Sure. Hey friends, it's Vasco again, now with a bit longer announcement. I'm part of the team that is behind the Global Scrum Master Summit, the conference dedicated to the Scrum Master role. If you're a Scrum Master, the Scrum Master Summit is the place to learn, to share, and of course, to meet new friends. We will have lots of live sessions where you can meet and network with other Scrum Masters from the whole globe. So make sure you check it at bit.ly forward slash SM Summit 22. We have several amazing teams notes and seven tracks that feature people like you and of course thought leaders sharing their insights their knowledge and helping you become an awesome scrum master you can check out all of the details of the summit including the keynotes announced the track chairs and much more at bit.ly forward slash sm summit 22 that's all one word that's bit.ly forward slash sm s-u-m-m-i-t and the numeral 2-2 i'll see you on the conference floor